morning, namaste. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, namaste. On behalf of Central Zoo Authority and Sri Chamarajendra Zoological Gardens, I extend a warm welcome to all our listener participants. This is the seventh in the series of webinars we have initiated to reach out to the zoo community of topics that are of mutual interest and also to bring to you global experts who are well known and respected, uh, respected in this field. Today, through this digital platform, we bring to you some very esteemed speakers to discuss and dwell upon the aspect of new frontiers of veterinary care in zoos. And at the onset, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. S. P. Yadav, uh, an Indian forest officer uh, who is currently the ADG of Project Tiger and also the member secretary of National Tiger Conservation Authority and Central Zoo Authority. Uh, Dr. Yadav is an Indian Forest Service officer with a distinguished career in wildlife management. He has been instrumental in bringing policy reforms for global tiger conservation, besides leading the new facilitatory role of Central Zoo Authority. So I would request you to give your opening remarks and also set the scene and context for this webinar. Well, thank you very much, Sonali. And very good afternoon to all participants. And good afternoon to our two experts, Dr. Pradhan from the Smithsonian Institution, US, Washington, DC, and Dr. Paulo. Uh, animal welfare is the fundamental of any zoo, any captive wildlife management anywhere in the world. And when we talk of animal welfare, the veterinary care becomes the most important aspect of the zoo management or captive animal management. Uh, before that, uh, before I go into the slide uh, this presentation, I would like to inform you that uh, all participants, although all the participants of India, they very well know that uh, Central Zoo Authority is a statutory body created by the government of India to regulate zoos in the country to uh, control the mushrooming of captive animal facilities in the country and it was created in 1992 to regulate zoos in the country. So any zoo for that matter in India cannot be created, cannot operate without recognition, getting recognition of the Central Zoo Authority. So for this, uh, unlike other countries, the central role of Central Zoo Authority and functions of Central Zoo Authority are a little different. And uh, for establishment of zoo, for animal exchanges, to approve the designs. The Central Zoo Authority has the mandate to approve the master plans, master layout plans, and all uh, such things which a zoo requires to for proper functioning. In fact, the Central Zoo Authority also extends uh, technical, scientific, and also financial support to the zoos of the country. There are uh, quite large number of zoo in the country, 152. They are large zoos, medium scale zoos, mini zoos. And there are also rescue centers. They are included in the definition of zoo in the country. They are spread across the country in all, almost all states. Next slide, please. Uh, captive, when we talk captive animal healthcare, uh, I feel that there is Dearth of capacity. Although it's mandatory for any zoo to have vet doc uh, veterinary doctor, it's mandatory to have veterinary doctors to take care of animals. But if you see the course curriculum of a BBSC or MBSC in the country, they hardly have any uh, much much uh, syllabus for the wild animal healthcare. Most of the veterinary, veterinarians in our country, they are trained, they are educated to take care of cattle. So I feel that there is a huge gap in the capacity. We have IVRA, Indian Veterinary Research Institute at Aizat Nagar, and that has been uh, termed as a national reference center. But I strongly feel that uh, there is much, much to be done to uh, train our veterinary doctors on wildlife uh, health management. This one health concept is very, very important. Right now, the G20 meeting of agriculture ministers of these countries are going on. 
and they are also discussing the One Health approach. This pandemic, COVID-19, has given a shock, and it, it, it is given a reminder, a strong reminder, to the world over, to individuals and the governments and organizations that how our life, the life of human being, is intervened with the nature and the animals. This has indicated very strongly. Um, this 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 has conveyed the message that there is a need of one health approach, where human health, where human health is dependent upon the animal health and vice versa, and there is possibility of uh, uh, welfare of human as well as animals in this approach. Next slide, please. So this one health paradigm. Uh, looks like this is the necessity this is the call of the present time and uh, as i said this pandemic has taught us a lesson it has and it has given a kind of reminder to seriously start working in this direction next please next slide please in fact uh, if you see this slide cza was working with the Smithsonian Institution for veterinary care of uh, wild animals and capacity building of our uh, veterinary doctors who are working in the zoo. And in, with this association and with the help of uh, IVRI, uh, the CJD has come out with several publications, but uh, they're all available on, on the public domain on the website of CJD. But still, I feel that there is a need of uh, much more capacity building of our officers and doctors. Next slide, please. The way forward, as I said, that uh, the one plan approach is very, very important. And also, there is much more research is needed. Research is needed than exchange of best practices between uh, the zoos international zoos to India and vice versa. There are many diseases which are prevalent and uh, I remember the help of uh, Dr. Buddha and the Smithsonian Institution in treating the canine distemper virus in the lions of Itawa. And first time we successfully, uh, the lions, they got cured with the help of the Smithsonian and that was amazing. Otherwise, we were thinking that it's almost impossible. <clears throat> So there are many diseases like elephant herpes virus and captive elephants. That this is occurred in Nandan Kanan Zoo where quite a few uh, zoonal uh, calves they died because of elephant herpes virus. Now the babesiosis, uh, the disease is prevalent in the lions in uh, Gujarat, and there are so on. There are means there are a number of diseases which are causing a lot of uh, practical problem like uh, they need proper we need proper case studies proper disease management protocol and and i think that and this this gives an opportunity for better collaboration with uh, international institutions international zoos those who have very good experience in it and this is how we can achieve the animal welfare in our zoos in india and this kind of webinar, I think they are very, very useful in, in getting the best practices across the world to our country. And uh, with these words, I close my remarks and I'm looking forward for the presentation from Dr. Paolo as well as Dr. Bhutan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, your opening remarks have been useful in setting the tone for the webinar today and what is uh, we want to aim at from this webinar. And what we have learned over this, because uh, this is our seventh uh, webinar in the series, is that what the pandemic uh, can create as an adversity, we can create into an opportunity. And we are extremely fortunate to have esteemed uh, speakers from both ends of the globe today connected with us. So uh, I would like to first invite Dr. Paolo Martini. Uh, he is the chief veterinarian of Ocean Park in Hong Kong, and he has been there since 1993. Uh, having been uh, with the Singapore Zoo and then now moved on to the Hong Kong Ocean Park from 2005 to present. 
Uh, for him, this would be a compilation of personal observations and opinions relating to the role and impacts of zoos uh, and uh, some predictions and opinions on what the future of zoological clinical medicine could be or should be. So over to you, sir, for your uh, keynote. Thank you very much. Let me start by sharing my screen here. I hope you can all see it. Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk with you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll, I'll be sharing really from a, a very narrow parochial point of view of the working veterinarian what some of the trends uh, that I, I think are uh, occurring uh, mean for our profession. The uh, set the set has changed a lot. I mean, I started in 93 in zoo medicine. Obviously, many things have changed. And uh, I think I have some, some ideas of what is uh, emerging and uh, what may set the tone in the future. I'd like to share some with you. Uh, don't don't expect like you know words of wisdom or historical perspective. I, I like both of those things, but uh, more maybe some topics of conversations you you guys can continue over drinks on, on on your side. The first one. Let's start. Uh, there's a growing hostility towards captivity. Frankly, from the vet point of view, it is not a big impact. Actually, it's been positive than that from the veterinary point of view because vets are generally on the, uh, the public opinion and uh, the public opinion being hostile has often forced management to make some changes that were not done when there was only internal. So that in, in a way has been quite useful. The way I uh, inform myself and my staff to deal with this uh, public sentiment that is seemingly hostile is first of all stick to your area of competence don't spill over you have one just uh, use that and in in the words of jimmy page you know just work with honesty competence and passion that is definitely good enough and also i suspect this hostility attitude will matter for much longer because this is based centered around this idea of captivity versus wild artificial versus natural in situ versus ex situ, and these are kind of blending. Uh, to show you a picture from the, the beautiful Sri Lanka, this is a natural park, but what is natural in Sri Lanka? It's been occupied for so long, the water bodies are not original. Uh, it's almost meaningless to ask, and actually it is meaningless to ask, it, it, it doesn't matter what's natural or not, there's a space available for uh, humans and other species to exist. Uh, even more difficult to define in China, the Yangtze finless porpoise, one of the sweetest cetaceans out there, one of the most endangered. They have these remarkable reserves that are made of oxbows that are isolated from the original habitat. So they're defined as ex situ. But if you look at this across the fences, it would be considered in situ. This is ex situ. This is another reserve and this gigantic lake is full of purpose that are, are thriving. And behind this ridge, there's the in situ. So it, it's almost meaningless, it's blending into one. And I think as the terms stop describing reality, the, the conversation will shift as well. That takes us to welfare and I, I'm, I'm grateful to Prof Yadav's uh, words. Uh, welfare is central to everything we do as uh, vets, it's central to our profession. <laughs> One of the useful developments uh, that's reasonably recent is the uh, emergence of a very productive and intelligent animal welfare science. And that, that gives us something to talk about because being scientific, we actually have framework that was easier to discuss without getting lost at different planes of resolution. It's often avoided because it takes you into animal rights and there, there's a little bit of hostility from the animal uh, professionals field towards animal rights. I don't think that's actually justified. Uh, animal welfare is an extension of the paradigm of human welfare and human welfare is absolutely intimately linked to human rights. So it kind of makes sense that they would be coming in the, in the conversation. I think expanding the concept that we can improve quality of life, not just 
for humans, but also for animals. And even landscapes and inan inanimate objects makes perfect sense and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, you have to ask why should you stop on the animal oppression? Clearly, not, nobody should be. Uh, we find animals in the garbage. Uh, this is a local uh, beach in Hong Kong with plastic bottles and a rotting porpoise. But, you know, we, we find that for our own species, we destroy habitats of animals, we destroy habitats of people too. So I think really it's it's the same fight for a better tomorrow. And uh, we can't separate what's happening to animals and the environment from what's happening to us. Uh, it's, it's a question of global justice and, and we are part of it. Uh, it's more a question of what we can stop doing than what we should do more. And these are some suggestions, like stop making so many babies, stop producing so much rubbish, stop concentrating all the wealth of the world in, in a few hands, and then stop being, you know, cheated by this idea of sustainable development. There is no such thing. And, and start finding better paradigm to, to be the rest. As a result of this, uh, this new predominant concept that are kind of global, uh, zoos have, for number of years decided that they must have a demonstrable contribution to conservation. And I want to insist on this term demonstrable. It's, it's a very important one. Because conservation, ironically, like, like development, which is its nemesis, has very broad shoulders. And, and you, you, you hear it served up every source out there. But uh, you always have to ask yourself, is this authentic conservation? Is this phony conservation? Where, where are we with it? Conservation is not a new concept and it's not a very popular one. Uh, next slide is not coming, just a second. Yeah. So if you read this sentence, uh, it kind of describes what's happening to, to our planet and to our environment. So, you know, beaches being taken, mountains being cut, etc., etc. Sounds like it describes the world today, but actually this was written 2000 years ago. And I suspect that for the 5,000 years before this guy, there was somebody else saying it. And for the next 5,000 years, there'll be some more people saying it. That's why I'm saying, unfortunately, conservation is clearly not a very catchy idea since we, we haven't seemed to be, we don't seem to be making much headway in, in, in that sense. So we, we, I think we have to put this in, into context uh, as well. From a vet point of view, to go back to the parochial purpose of this talk, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that zoos want to do that. Uh, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, more than 10 years ago now, we were approached by an uh, American group who wanted to study uh, pathogens of uh, lions in the wild. We used our lions in Singapore Zoo to develop the technique using endoscopy. And then we went to Botswana to catch lions in the wild, sample them in the wild, release them after sampling. So it's, it's an amazing opportunity to advance science, but also to advance your own expertise and, and to have a really good time with uh, colleagues you wouldn't normally meet. Another thing that is kind of linked uh, is more of a subtrend here is that because of this uh, important uh, place on being relevant to conservation, we are also trying to be relevant to local communities and uh, communities of our peers, which can be local or just uh, sharing same values. So here is a picture of a colleague of mine uh, uh, participating in something we do here in Hong Kong, where we help with the translocation and the contraception of uh, species that are sometimes entering in uh, conflict with humans, in this, in this case, wild boar, we do the same with macaques. And we support NGOs uh, around the region, sometimes quite far away, actually. And uh, the focus here is really to transfer the skills. So we, we, we treat them the same way that we like to treat our consultants. I'll get back to that. Uh, as in transfer as much knowledge and know-how as possible. And here is an example in Indonesia, the, the orangutan was caught in a snare, suffered horrible injuries, was caught in the snare for almost 10 days, surviving on rainwater alone. The local NGO did a phenomenal job keeping it alive, getting it back in health. Then they hit a part where they lack the technical skills and the equipment for a proper amputation. So they called us, we went with our uh, equipment and, and uh, our skills, we did the amputation and the animal could be released. So this is great for the animal, obviously it's great for the NGO, it's great for us. Similar story in uh, uh, Palawan, this is a confiscation of a rare and endangered turtle, the Palawan forest turtle. 
several people from around the region, including us, went there. And really, as manpower, more than expert, but at least people who have a habit of dealing with turtles, we went. We could do a very fast triage. And more than 90% of the animals could be released to the native habitat within two days of being confiscated, which is really the key to a successful uh, reintroduction, I mean, uh, handling of such a, such a shipment. This is in our local waters, unfortunately, lots of boats and, and a number of dolphins, so small boat strikes are common. And in this case, you know, we go out, we assess. In this case, that we're to capture, we examine, and after two days, we decided this animal has to be put to sleep for human reason. A few years later, similar problem, different animal, but you can tell that it's almost it's almost identical injury because it's, it's the same uh, cause. In this case, we felt the animal was a lot more mobile and he was still with his friends. So we decided we'll just give a long acting antibiotic. But thankfully for dolphins, we have the choice of the antibiotic that lasts for two weeks. So we, we injected it by dart and then we went out after 10 days to, to check if we get a second dose. It looked like that. We decided this animal is going to be fine. And then it was sighted again 11 weeks later. And, and it was sighted again recently. Actually, I don't have a picture, but it seems to be doing fine. So this is the kind of uh, impact that this has on zoo uh, veterinary work. Another impact uh, is of, of the previous trend is that the are also getting accreditations. Now India is a little bit ahead of the rest, uh, as you heard from uh, Dr. Yadav, that zoos already must be part of an organized structure. It's not the case everywhere. It's still a good idea to get additional accreditations. It forces a number of SOPs and it forces a number of changes to be made, which invariably are to the benefit of the vet department or the veterinarian, because veterinarian work and facilities are central to be able to get a good accreditation, to, to successfully apply for accreditation. So that's definitely your interest to push for that and to participate in those uh, things. It improves your skills as it improves your facilities. And now I want to step back a little bit. Uh, everything I've mentioned so far is how the world is coming together and so on. That's all nice, but uh, again, this is something that we've known for a long time. That it's a little bit naive to try to have everyone be the same. And not only is naive, it's bound to fail. And it's also imperial, it's intolerant, and it's antagonistic to try to have everyone have the same values. It's, it's not something we should aim for. And uh, I think it's important to be relevant in, in your immediate surrounding before you're relevant to some faraway entities. That's just a caveat. And to get around that, what you can do is go back to the term demonstrable, means having measurable outcomes. Because an outcome, if you wanted to put a bit of a simplistic mathematical formula, would be a function of your values, your expectation, your skills, and your resources. And these are variables that change with time and place. So if you take topics like euthanasia, uh, I think in, in India it is, it is a giant taboo and a very difficult topic from, from conversations I've had with colleagues. Uh, here, for me personally, my value is that it's a form of madness and, and cruelty not to euthanize something that's bound to die in pain. For others, it, it's a horrible thing. And colleagues in, in Thailand and India have particularly strong opinions on that. And it's really not of anybody's business uh, to judge each other's value. Just provide your expertise. So if your expertise is it has to be euthanized, that's your advice. People can take it or not. It's okay. Uh, another trend that is, can be good or bad is that everything is internet-based, in, including this almost conversation we're having now. And uh, it changes a lot of things. First of all, it got some negative things uh, at the population level. It, it furthers reduced the intimacy with nature, so it's a bad thing. But it also has some benefits that, that you, can, you can read here. Scrutiny is good because when you know people are watching, you do a better job, especially for those of us who are not so hard working, knowing somebody is watching uh, encourages you to do better. The big difference I find that I don't particularly like is that it changes the nature of the conversation. There's no spontaneity. Things are recorded. So if I say now, oh, I don't use this technique, I think it's rubbish. It's recorded forever. Somebody can come back years from now to say, oh, this guy knows nothing. He thinks this technique is rubbish. It's not the gold standard, you know? So it means that the discussions tend to be watered down and then things tend towards the mediocre. 
but that's that's uh, just a question of adapting. It's also a problem for the students because then they rely a lot on their phones, the smartphones. Sometimes the phones are smarter than they are, and they do everything through the through the data collection. But it's not the same. Googling, it's not even a word. If you Google something like enlarged abdomen in a macaque, you get 12,000 hits. And the first 20 were thoroughly useless. As I didn't look at all of them. Who can? But if you do a basic investigative method as you're taught in, in school, with just a basic, a, a number of basic questions, uh, you have been able to narrow down the investigation where the solution is net. And that takes me to another good trend, which is that vet schools are getting better and better. And their interest in non domestic species, non conventional species, I should say, is growing. And there, there's a number of certification and specialties that are coming up. And that's obviously is, is self evident benefits. Uh, I, I do find that uh, schools in general, it's true for medical schools as well, uh, are lacking in comparative biology, comparative evolution. And so sometimes you get some people surprised at the wrong thing. I had a doctor surprised that, oh, animals also have spleens. So, <laughs> Why wouldn't they? Do you think God made them differently? Or do you think even God made them? I mean, there's some very strange conversation going on. There. Um, maybe also a bit too much nurturing of the students. Uh, they, when they get into the real world, they, they're a bit surprised at how things work sometimes. I think this could be improved. But overall, it's definitely a benefit. Uh, some trend also is there's more women in the profession. Some people make a big deal of it, uh, for good or for bad. If you see the picture here, you see 1965, the year I was born, all dudes, except one lonely girl here. And then in, 19, in 2018, basically all girls, very few uh, boys, and I assume the short hair with pencil boys, which is actually quite tragic that such cliches still work. But anyway, um, in my personal opinion, it really doesn't make a difference in the vet quality and the individual variation far outweigh the gender variation, so I don't think it has made a difference in my life. I can see that there are problems having too many boys around, but there's no benefit in having too many girls around, so I, I don't think that's a really important benefit. What is very important on the other hand is that staff at all levels, from the gardener to the director, better and better over the years. It is becoming to hire people with no education at all. When I started, many keepers, very low education, or were elite. many were good keepers, were not. Now, all of my trainers have, many of them have the same number of years in university I have. Many of them are good, some of them are not. Uh, so, overall, when a guy with an education can read and write and went to university, is not good at his job, it's a lot easier to get him or her to get better than if he can barely read. Right. So that, that's definitely a good, a good change. It also encourages communication between departments because then, then people have a, a better education level. And also it allows better care of the animals because training becomes easier. And that takes us to an increased veterinary influence in zoo management and animal husband. There are many parts of a zoo that requires a veterinary input and it's happening more and more, which is good because it makes it more animal centric. And um, I think it's important to choose the right vets there because if you choose a vet that just wants to use that to feel important and drive a bigger car, it's, it, it's a shame. You just wasted your money on the, you, that position should be occupied by somebody who wants to use it to be a responsible person who, with a love of the collection and his profession, take charge of what's happening in the zoo and, and so forth. So that is central because again, go looking at the impact on the vet profession, most of diseases are caused by lifestyle. Yeah, you can see it with uh, the COVID, poor people die more than rich people because they live in cramped quarters compared to rich people. Uh, same goes for animals. So all of the problems in these slides are completely avoidable through husbandry. None of the problems on this slide actually can be solved. This one's dead, too late for that one. This is never gonna grow back. This animal has a gigantic wound on his side just because the fence wasn't properly made and this is a nutrition issue that, actually this one's already dead, but it's uh, it's very difficult to correct. 
also no self-respecting vet will ever agree to building something like this. This is from the zoo that will remain unnamed. Uh, obviously not a way to keep uh, animals. Why? Because even if you just the selfish, from the selfish point of view, you don't want to deal with cases like this one, where you have animals presented with problems you can't solve. There's no way you can solve that eye infection when the animal is living in his own feces. And speaking of vet expertise, it's becoming more and more easy to get a uh, consultant uh, support. And uh, the Buddha is going to talk more about this, so I, I won't say too much of it. I would just insist that you use that to acquire in-house skills. Uh, the consultants, you, you do slightly more sophisticated work uh, with him and you can take over some of the things that you used to rely on him. It really does a lot to increase the trust in the vet team. Here is a picture of me going to learn from a colleague in South Africa how to place a certain type of satellite tags on crocodile. The crocs a bit too good to fit on the slide there. And here at, at the same uh, trip where we're sharing on a car because sharing is never is impossible to share only one way for knowledge. So it's always beneficial. Here is a, a colleague of mine working with our consultant on a Panda Dental, and then the same two folks, this time both of them would be considered consultants going out for a walrus procedure, one doing the dental, one doing the anesthesia. So it's a really good way to grow professionally. We've learned to use an operating microscope, now we can do a lot of our own eye work here in on fish, but we've learned from the proper uh, expert uh, while working on the more uh, difficult scenarios uh, on, on other species so forth. Another trend is minimally invasive surgery is, is growing. Uh, I'll have to go a little faster. You still need to do your basic surgeries, which means ordinary vet work on, on extraordinary species, but it will avoid having complications like this. This is an evisceration post neutering, and then we learn to do them endoscopically, and you might remember this picture from earlier. We do this in aquatic animals now, like in, in a seal. The seal is back in the water the next day. This is a seal we had to remove the reprotract because it had tumors. And then you can just extend it to uh, all kinds of other species. Uh, there's, the limit is your, your imagination and, and your resources, your collection. Another big important uh, element uh, is assisted reproductive technology. I'm going to talk a, a lot more and better on this. Uh, just so they were clear, this is central to the role of zoos in the past, in the present, and in the future. This is not going to change. The preservation, propagation, and genetic management of, of animals will remain central to our, uh, our purpose. And also it can be used in human-animal conflict resolution. You saw the picture of my colleague with the boar. We are doing endoscopic uh, contraception in the field on those animals and releasing them sterile. Some pictures. This is a dolphin born a year and a half ago. His father, the, well, the donor of the sperm, died 11 years before this one was born. And the semen had actually been frozen for 14 years. So although an animal is no longer present or is either dead or in a different country, it can still contribute to the genetic uh, of the population, which is really important when you're dealing with small populations. This is a uh, Something we're doing now is our elasmobranchs, uh, semen collection, semen preservation. We're trying to find good ways to freeze the semen. We can preserve it uh, uh, chilled for 10 days, but not, not frozen. And then we do pregnancy checks and so forth. Uh, and ART, as in assisted reproductive technologies, go hand in hand with endoscopy, which is nice because you can combine two uh, interesting uh, things. Uh, this is in the macaque, super ovulation, and collection, ICSI for embryo, embryo transfer, baby. It sounds simple when you say it like that. There's a little bit more to it, and you can find it in this paper. It's also a good way to do reproductive assessment of your animals. This is a healthy macaque. This is one with a minor adhesion to an ovulation site, and then you can see you can diagnose things that are not easy to diagnose. For example, ectopic pregnancy. This would be a challenge uh, for very good vets to, uh, even, I should say, even for very good vets to diagnose an ectopic pregnancy in the macaque, whereas it's kind of obvious on the, on the endoscopy, it requires hardly any training at all. Good luck doing that by uh, ultrasound or palpation. And I mentioned the sterilization. We do vasectomy and tubectomy, so the animals go back outside 
with uh, the behavior and uh, social structure intact. And I will finish on what I think is the most significant development in wildlife management in the last 15 years. Uh, I think it's comparable to the time when we finally developed the confidence to anesthetize just about everything, and it's operant conditioning. It really is still in its infancy when it comes to wildlife management, which is learning how to use these extremely powerful science and, and, and technique and art. It's a bit like medicine. It's on the crossroad between many sciences and art. And uh, we're, we're really just learning to use it on wildlife. But in zoo, in zoo animals, it's great. It allows you, for example, to look inside the mouth of an old tapir or a panda, take blood from a red panda without any form of constraint. This is a, a elephant in Cambodia, got caught in a snare, lost his leg. He's a boy, he's gonna grow big, he's gonna get angry. So he was trained to come several times a day, give his food to the trainer, uh, who's then doing very nice stump management several times a day without any form of coercion. Uh, so that is really a, to success. Some cases could not be managed without open conditioning. Uh, here I give you some other examples, uh, blood pressure in panda, dental work in sea lions, and then our trainers sometimes go a bit far, like here they train by themselves on the on the CT table, just got a CT scan. And I will stop here because my time is up. Uh, the last time I came to the CISA day, the, the, we still had coffee breaks. It was great. We had a chance to chit chat and uh, talk about each other's presentation. Uh, this time, I think we cannot, uh, but uh, look forward to the next speaker. Thank you. I'll return the platform to Sonali. Let me. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that was extremely uh, useful and uh, very thought provoking, especially the way you said that animal welfare is an extension of human welfare. Uh, which essentially is also uh, a consideration of human rights. Uh, so that's that's an eye opener and the way we look at it. Uh, operant conditioning and if husbandry is bad, then no more, uh, no other kind of treatment will help. These are some of the key messages for me, which were very, very uh, extremely useful. And to carry forward with your thought process, I would like to now invite our next speaker. Uh, which is Dr. Budan Pukazendi. Sir, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, you are the research physiologist at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. You've been there since 1992, uh, following your veterinary training in Madras Veterinary College, uh, where you completed your master's and doctoral degree in biochemistry and wildlife reproduction. Uh, you direct the research on rare and endangered ungulates at the Smithsonian and have been involved in conservation and training projects of various countries. I'm sure, sir, there are a lot of people who know you from your India connection or who have been trained by you are watching today. Uh, so over to you, sir, for your uh, talk. Good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, especially to Central Zoo Authority, um, the member secretary, uh, Sonali, and uh, Devinder, who's uh, been a huge supporter of our collaboration um, so um, it's a, a really great to follow up with after Paulo's uh, presentation. And in fact, uh, Paulo and I, I think we met like 20 years ago, we realized uh, just a few days ago. Uh, so our, even though we are so far apart and uh, time flies by, it's again, this is a great opportunity for us to even reconnect and maybe look at new opportunities amongst between ourselves. So in this presentation, I am going to get to the basics. Um, I think um, Paulo painted the picture of how holistic our approach to conservation should be. And the key component, when you talk about veterinary science, we cannot shy away from the fundamentals of veterinary medicine. And that is really the focus of my presentation. And obviously I will also touch upon a few more recent developments in terms of diagnostic tools that may be um, available and is available in people may be interested in. So in terms of general uh, organization, uh, Paula touched upon this. If you look at it, this is a very, very, uh, what, what you call a stripped down organization chart. But the key thing that I want to point out is here, this is where animal care falls in. Oftentimes, in a number of institutions, the animal care, somebody in the leadership position 
is reporting directly to the deputy director or the director. So it's a top leadership. And then under, under the animal care situation, you have the curators, you have the veterinarians, you have nutritionists, pathologists. And this is that group, it's a team that needs to work together to make this animal care successful and animal welfare taken care of. Our goal, most of the zoos we are all interested in is to you know, maintain healthy animals, provide the best animal wel welfare, and also support research and, and conservation. So if, if any of this fails, we will never be able to accomplish the goals of the animal care or what the zoos has set out to do. So it's, it's such a critical piece of our work that oftentimes is overlooked given, <clears throat> given either the institutional structure or some of the cultural aspects that we have to deal with from one country to another. Uh, veterinarians oftentimes are not given a seat at the, at, uh, at the table um, in terms of the leadership or decision making. So something for us to all consider how we can make some of those changes happen. So talking about this, what is involved in it? As I mentioned, again, animal programs, animal health, nutrition, pathology. And I also included facilities. When I say facilities, these are people who maintain the operations uh, behind the scenes or who are going to come and help you to transport an animal safely. And building uh, chutes or building crates, we do need to take, in, take them into consideration. Security is another one. Uh, typically in most of the Western zoos, when you're moving uh, dangerous animals across the park to your veterinary hospital, there is always a security detail that goes with it. In the event something were to go wrong or the animal were to escape, you need to have plans in place. Whether it is darting, there might be options where you can dart an animal and bring it back to safety. There might be occasions when you may even have to consider a lethal option if it is posing a risk to the public. So that is one more of the conversation that would have to happen, especially when you're handling dangerous animals. So it is multidisciplinary. I would always say that it starts with the keepers. Paulo mentioned that making sure you have educated, committed keepers who know their animals, who know what the signs, first signs of the illness is, and caring for those animals. So, I mean, most of these people really, really care for their animals, almost to the risk of maybe considering those animals as their own pets, uh, but it's okay. Sometimes, you know, that sort of an association with their collection animals is important to figure out what is wrong with those animals. The veterinarians come in where once you hear information from them that how do you prevent this? How do you diagnose it? How, how do you treat it? Sometimes you also run in parallel. Some of the diagnostics is run in parallel with the pathologist that you have on site or a consultant. And nutrition is really, really fundamental to all health and well-being of animals. So we, this is something that we cannot afford to overlook in any sort of an human care operation like our zoos and breeding centers. The challenge in zoo animal medicine is this, the wide variations in anatomy. It's not very generic. We always argue veterinarians are maybe a little bit more smarter than the human physicians because of the diversity of the anatomy and physiology that we see. Behavior is one. The size completely changes what you can do with a, a small amphibian versus an elephant. The animals are also beautifully adapted to hide their symptoms in terms of the natural surrounding. Any sign of weakness makes them a target and that seems to be inherent to them so that they don't show very many symptoms until it's really, really severe. So there are also some cases where you cannot examine an animal safely without anesthesia, which is also a risky operation. So always, at least in my mind, when, when I go into a procedure or we go into a procedure, we always say, anytime you are anesthetizing or handling an animal, it is a risky operation, there is a risk. All we have to do is we have to try and minimize the risk, but you can never ever absolutely eliminate risk. So everybody, all the way up to the, the director or the administration leadership should be aware of it and be able to support some of the activities of the veterinarians who are, who are trying to provide the best care for the animals, take, knowing very well there is risk. Diversity, every bit of size. So you can see from a, a little frog here to elephant. So that's the challenge that we as veterinarians and zoos have to deal with. 
Veterinarians typically consider themselves, at least zoo veterinarians, consider themselves as generalists because um, Paula mentioned our training is typically that anybody that's coming into this field is trained in small animal medicine or large animal medicine, and maybe a little bit of information on the human medicine. And the, 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 the challenge is very few people, um, that, again, in, in several countries, it's very different. And I feel that this might be the case in India too, where few of the veterinarians who are graduating have the opportunity to get hands-on experience and build that confidence to safely handle and treat animals. So here's just a, a synopsis of what a veterinarian is required to have for being recruited as a, uh, a full-time staff at a zoo in the US. Obviously a degree in veterinary medicine, this is key, at least five years of relevant experience. And that could be at all different levels, working at a rescue center, a rehab center, working in, in other zoos as an assistant or in an intern. All of those are important. Communication and interpersonal skills, Paula touched upon this. This is very important because you do need to be able to communicate clearly, not only to your own administration, but also to the public, what you're doing, why is it important? And if something were to go wrong, explain what precautions you took and why it still went wrong and trying to come up with options to, to minimize it. In more and more of the zoos these days in the Western uh, world, uh, the, some sort of a board certification for zoo medicine is also becoming a, a, a almost a fundamental qualification to be hired. So I mentioned the path itself, you know, after uh, being a veterinary student in any sort of uh, a general veterinary background, Students who track or are interested in wildlife, they end up volunteering in a lot of different scenarios. Here's a, a rescue and rehab center where a student is learning to handle and treat animals. And here's another situation where some students even travel abroad to other NGOs that they are that are caring for animals and, and shadowing a veterinarian who has tremendous amount of experience and learning from such people is one of the best experiences you can think about because that is how you learn. If you don't have the option of trial and error, you cannot make mistakes, but yes, learning from the best, you always carry that uh, experience with you. And you can see here, the majority of the zoos um, have veterinarians who have 10, 20, 30 years of experience in that field. And imagine how much they would have seen all the co complex cases they have seen and addressed how do you translate that to a person who has just finished a degree in veterinary medicine coming to take care of the entire collection? That's outright impossible. So there needs to be that transition from being a veterinarian for large animals, small animals, to get that exposure in wildlife and then before moving on to a full-time job. The roles are very straightforward. Preventive medicine, diagnosis, conservation medicine, clinical research training. I'm not going to touch upon this. Paula touched upon this a little bit. So I'm gonna uh, focus mostly on these. Everyone believes that prevention is the best option because if you can prevent a, a disease condition, then you don't have to break your head about curing it and fixing it. So, but this is also one of those areas where if you're systematic, you can really, really save yourself a lot of headache. Routine exams, as I always say, you cannot shy away from the fundamentals of veterinary medicine. It basically comes down to doing a complete assessment of the animal, either visual or getting your hands on these animals, looking at your collection, uh, the entire collection sometimes, so that you have a healthy, vibrant, self-sustaining population in your zoo. Simple things like blood work, x-rays, and sometimes you have to do specific uh, disease training. Vaccination is an important tool for veterinarians because this is one of the best way. I mean, we already know in, in the time of COVID, all the conversation is focused on vaccination because that is the way, you know, option, one of the option we have available right now to prevent the spread of the disease. And likewise, this is something that is available to veterinarians in the zoo community, and we need to use this more often. <clears throat> I mentioned it in, in some of my interactions with um, the leadership in India too, that certain vaccines that may not be available to practitioners I think we need to figure out a way to get those vaccines approved for use in, in wildlife species because that can save life and, and it will significantly improve quality of life. Um, <clears throat> Member Secretary Soyada mentioned the canine distemper outbreak. Yes, 
getting vaccine into the country was a significant part of that effort and with the support of therapy. So <clears throat> we need to focus on that now too. Looking at parasitology, uh, this is a nice way, an easy and cheap way of looking at the health of the animals. All these animals, every animal that we have in your collection is going to eat and they're going to poop. And having a keeper um, collect that fecal sample and bring to the lab so you can look at what is happening in, in, in the system. And there are uh, plenty of options for treating those uh, conditions safely. And you can really fix a problem right in the beginning. <clears throat> in a larger management scenario, we, we talk about these in, in the US and Western countries in terms of a, a breeding center. When you have a large herd of animals, you do not have to focus on individual animals in this herd. We practice herd medicine. So you can randomly go and look at this herd, collect some fecal samples and diagnose what's going on. If one animal has it, if somebody has it with fecal sample, very likely this entire herd is in, affected by it. So you can take treating those animals as a whole, as a herd scenario. I mentioned nutrition. This is a key component of zoo animal medicine. And you can see here in this picture of the shell, sometimes when I walk through our nutrition, um, our commissary, I feel that the food, and the quality of the food and how it is maintained is way better than what you'd see in a supermarket where we buy uh, supplies from. So really pushing the standards of commissary in nutrition and zoos is very important because if you can manage healthy animals <clears throat> purely by providing the best nutrition, you can avoid metabolic diseases. You can really, really eliminate the need for keeping animals in, in, in long-term treatment. And sometimes nutrition is also, nutritionists are also helpful in determining special diets for animals that are hospitalized, that are sick. And figuring out novel ways of medicating these animals without having to stress them out. And that is where some of the keepers come into play, the nutritionists come into play, trying to work together and come up with a system that you can get the medication in the animal consistently. When it comes to diagnosis, there are a lot of different illnesses here. It could be trauma, some of the slides that follow shared. It could be metabolic, reproductive issues, dental, all of these are options. The key thing is to diagnose the condition. And Paula mentioned too, it is as simple as getting your hands on these animals, doing a thorough physical exam and, and determining what might be happening. We necessarily need not jump to uh, online internet search to find out what that solution may be. History, very important. Um, this is something that is missing in the human medicine nowadays because time is money. Uh, oftentimes they don't pay much attention to history, but when it comes to wildlife, that is very key because none of these subjects are willing and are able to even describe what is wrong with them. Then we have to determine how do you restrain them? Do you just physically restrain them or you use anesthesia? <clears throat> what sort of examinations do you need to conduct? And those are really driven by at least these, some of these bottom uh, bullet points are determined by what you really find at the time of physical exam. We also spend a lot of time in con conditioning animals because if you can get animals to cooperate, you can see a keep in a, vet <coughs> a veterinary resident and a keeper working with the porcupine to do an ultrasound exam. No anesthesia, the animal's in its exhibit. But that takes a lot of confidence and trust building between the keeper, the animal, and sometimes whoever is going to come and do it. And there needs to be a consistent approach because this is the person who's going to do the ultrasound you're better off having the same person doing it every time so that the animal doesn't have to wonder what the other person is gonna do. Here's a picture of a, a tiger that is being desensitized to receive an injection with no squeeze cage, nothing. And it's just conditioned with positive reinforcement of food. Squeeze cage, I've seen this also in operation in India. It's a very nice tool to have. Um, yes, sometimes the animals can react to it, but still it is a lot better than having to chase it around in a large enclosure and, and keep that way minimize a little bit of the stress. Obtaining history, and this is where keepers and the curators come into play because these are the people who are interacting with these animals on a regular basis. Veterinarians are in their veterinary hospitals taking care of the other animals, but these are the folks who are seeing what is, what the, how the behaviors are changing, what might be happening. So having knowledgeable keepers in your, in your team is, is the first and foremost thing that we need to focus on because 
that really makes the life of the veterinarian a lot more easier. And it, it makes it much more predictable that, you know, you can, you can see, you can trust a keeper. And when they come up with a description of a symptom, then the veterinarian has a lot more trust on the keeper to say like, well, let's try this or let's wait for a day and see how you manage that case. Initial exam, standard in any veterinary practice, you really want to have the ability to go look at the animal near the keeper who's helping with the, with the veterinarian here. And again, most of these operations are done in, in conjunction or in partnership with the keeper or a curator, because that's where the trust is. And the veterinarian sometimes, animals do not like veterinarians. The minute you walk into the building, their behavior changes very quickly. When, it, when you have to, you know, when you decide to anesthetize an animal, then you also want to make sure that you can safely anesthetize that animal, have all the monitoring in place to do it and reverse that animal and return, that, it, return it to its enclosure without any significant complication. A lot of different options, injectables, um, uh, gas anesthesia, and a whole bunch of options are available, but I'm not going to go into the detail of them. I mentioned the physical exam is key. You want to do it from head to toe. Do not avoid any area because once you have the animal anesthetized, it is pretty safe uh, as long as we have all the conditions in place. Have a systematic approach to it so that um, you, you cover all the topics. Blood work is also basic. Even now in human medicine, that's the first thing they ask you to do. Go and give a blood sample to the pathologist. Basic things like blood counts, uh, hemoglobin estimates, and metabolic status with assessment. And in certain cases, when you suspect infectious diseases, using uh, various available diagnostic tools that are there to see if the, an animal has been affected, has been exposed, or is it actually affected by a particular disease is very important so that you can manage that accordingly. Techniques, there are various uh, techniques available. Now, especially these days, you have a lot of options for portable x-rays. Uh, they're not very easy to work with. I mean, it's still heavy, <clears throat> but you get the results immediately. And you can, very similar to human medicine, where you can email those x-rays to a consultant elsewhere to get a second opinion on what you want to do. And also working with the animals, conditioning these animals to co uh, co cooperate with you for doing some of those diagnostics is also important so that the animal is not stressed and you are not stressed that you're going to either lose an instrument or um, uh, cause injury to anybody around the animal. Internal organs can be assessed in a number of ways. Uh, here's one, ultrasound, very common. Uh, it's a nice way of looking at um, the internal organs. Again, it does take training. It is not as simple as just taking a probe. So when, when Paolo is talking about training the right kind of people, the veterinarians getting that exposure, all of that is key, it, not just in the livestock. When you have that experience in small animals and large animals, it gives you a pretty decent landmark assessment. But when you go from species to species, some of those landmarks are going to change. Some of the presentation is going to be different. And having that experience is also important to have a, a much better ability to diagnose the condition. Here's an example. Most recently, we had our own panda that was diagnosed to be pregnant. Um, the panda says it no huge for a lot of institutions <clears throat> and getting that animal to cooperate, to get a nice visual of a fetus. This is not an easy task. Um, again, it takes hours and hours of training uh, of those animals and the keepers as well as the veterinarians who are doing it. Here's another example of somebody doing pregnancy diagnosis or health assessment in an elephant. Again, ultrasound is a very, very cool to, um, tool to have and make sure that we have the training behind it to utilize it at the most. Laparoscopy is another one. It can be used for diagnosis in some conditions. It may be also a nice way of minimally invasive way of obtaining biopsies for doing more advanced diagnostic, including histopathology, uh, reproductive assessments, and also reproductive technologies like artificial insemination oftentimes is done by laparoscopic uh, means. Endoscopy is another tool that is critical. Here's an example of a cheetah. Uh, they, they do uh, tend to be affected by gastritis, especially cheetahs that are in managed in zoos or in, in captive conditions. Here's a normal histological pattern of the uh, um, gastric tissue. And where you, in the bottom, severe gastritis, you see a huge infiltration of uh, 
uh, plasma cells and neutrophils into the entire um, uh, tissue, which is a suggestive of um, major, major gastritis uh, condition. So this has been accomplished purely by using endoscopy and doing a biopsy that can be diagnosed and then you know, the animal can be placed on a, in a treatment plan. Acupuncture laser therapy is also an emerging one. Uh, people are starting to use it. Uh, here's an animal, a 14-year-old lion, um, showing some uh, limb weakness. And we did have a consultant. We took the animal to a place to do a CT scan. At the National Zoo, we did not have a CT scan, but we are able to use some in other places. And then we came up with a plan where we have laser um, um, treatment. And that, at that time, the animal is awake and we're able to do it. We have conditioned these animals to cooperate so that you're not having to anesthetize it each time. Acupuncture is done when we have to anesthetize those animals, but overall the outcome has been good and the, and the quality of life has been improved. Dental work. Um, this is very common. Uh, I believe this is very common in, in zoos in India too, where tigers uh, may have broken canines. If, if left unattended, can lead to a lot of health issues because it can connect to this, it is connected to the sinuses and the infection go into sinus and then really um, cause uh, significant uh, health challenges for the animal. So taking care of it as soon as you find it is a critical way. It's very similar to our own dental care. When you see that your teeth is bothering, you're not waiting for the next 15 years to take care of it. You're trying to take care of it right away. Um, we do bring in specialists. So here's an example of a gorilla. <clears throat> Gorillas have a long history of cardiovascular diseases. Um, so the condition is called fibrosing cardiomyopathy. It's usually affects the ventricular tissue. But in addition, so anytime we have to anesthetize an animal, we are bringing in human cardiologists because there's it's a lot of similarities with human cardiology and gorilla. So we bring in experts. It's not that we always have to rely on our own veterinarians. And it is a good thing because that information is very important for providing a, a chair for the animal. There are also markers, biomarkers that have been validated that you can test using a blood sample. And once you find a value that is of concern, now your management can change to provide healthy, you know, provide optimal nutrition to minimize obesity and also look out for any of the cardiovascular diseases uh, to be um, seen in those animals. Reproductive, again, using surgery, surgical techniques, minimally invasive. Here's a tubal ligation in the orangutan. <clears throat> this is a nice way because some of this can, is re reversible. <clears throat> when an animal is not needed for reproduction, you can ligate it. And then when you want to bring it back into production, uh, re breeding situation, you can reverse that condition. We have done a similar technique in a, in a Schwalski horse. This animal was considered um, it was a valuable animal, produced a lot of offspring, and 15 years ago was considered, you know, uh, no, we don't need to breed this animal anymore. Until later on, when they realized about 10, 12 years later, wow, you know, this is our fourth most significant or genetically valuable animals um, in the population. So we ended up con consulting with a human um, infertility specialist. We were able to come back and use this animal to reverse the vasectomy. This is a vasoepididostomy and not a true vasectomy reversal because a vasectomy reversal will be a vas to a vas. And here we had to uh, fuse it with the epidermal um, uh, duct. And it was a successful technique, um, which took a lot of people and anesthesia in, in a large animal. But having the right training and the experts available, including consultants, made it possible that this animal was able to produce sperm subsequently. Specialists are significant. Not everything can be done by our own team, so they always rely on experts, whether it is in the veterinary medicine field or in the, in the human uh, consultant uh, perspective. A few more advanced techniques. Uh, CT scan, uh, I know a number of zoos in India are talking, you know, starting to think about these. This is a good tool to have, uh, but I think the key thing is this is a very advanced tool and you need more specialized training. And this is one more reason I say that. Let's you now we do need to focus on getting the fundamentals and giving the expertise and the training and the experience to people before we start switching over to some of these more advanced tools. Here's what it takes. It takes a village or takes the entire zoo to come together to come up with devices. How do you safely transport a rhino to get to a, a portable CT scan? But it was a very successful procedure that they were able to accomplish 
at the Chicago uh, Zoological Park. Another CT scan example of an animal female um, that after um, provide, you know, generating the calf uh, had a, a taxia, CT scan showed very clearly that the transverse processes were broken and you can see a reconstructing here. Again, it's a really nice tool and when sometimes X-ray is not revealing all the information. Infrared thermal imaging is another thing that is also starting to um, be used, um, especially you can see any, any of these colors, the red is significantly hot areas or inflamed. And here's a case where people are using a stem cell a, a, a treatment for giraffes. And you can see how some of these are changing very quickly in terms of um, how the cure, I mean, the treatment is happening, but it's a nice way of assessing if there are areas of inflammation in these animals. Quickly, I'm going to emphasize some of this. This is the work that we have been doing. We did for a couple of years in partnership with Central Zoo Authority of India. Um, a training program and a number of people at that time, the leadership here. Um, and here's one person, um, Devendra, who is still in the operation. I'm not sure who else is there. Uh, very, very instrumental in making sure that these training programs go very well. And we had a number of people from various zoos across the country uh, participate and the training was done in Delhi um, Zoo. Most of the training oftentimes includes lectures, um, obviously getting to know what the experiences, experience levels are. And we had anywhere from people who had maybe two months into the job versus five years, almost getting ready to leave the job and head back to their original job. We also had a way of assessing what the needs were and, and a few examples of demonstration or going through what it takes to prepare for these um, procedures. So in summary, I'm going to say communication is key among the curators, keepers, veterinarians, and all the way up to the administration to optimize animal care. We are, it's, I think this is the best model we, uh, we can uh, follow. Prevention is better than cure. Uh, try every, use every tool available to prevent the condition rather than deal with the cure later on. Um, have we lost uh, Dr. Budhan? Can you hear me? I can't hear him either. And the the, fry, the slide is frozen. the telephone. Sonali, you are muted. Sonali, you need to unmute. Dr. Paolo, can you hear me? Uh, sir, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, okay. I think we are trying to connect, reconnect to Dr. Budhan uh, because yes, uh, we do understand the technical limitations. And uh, having said that, fortunately, we are at the end of his presentation. So uh, we can again ask him uh, for his closing remarks. But having said that, I will now request Dr. Paolo. Uh, there were a couple of questions which came in. Uh, in the registration uh, uh, forms that we send out. Uh, so there's a question which I want to ask you, uh, which is that how do you judge that your uh, zoo animal mortality is normal? Are there any scale or benchmarks to gauge the situation? Sir. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it sounds like a simple question, but it, it really isn't. Um, so, it kind of depends a little bit on uh, on who's asking, which is not entirely honest way of answering. But uh, it's important to to understand mortality is a local uh, reality. So let's say the the lifespan 
the morbidity, the mortality, the response to treatment are all a function of the, the environment. So if you look at mortality of the entire collection and you have a collection big enough, you can go comparing year after year, but then you still have to decide what your benchmarks are. Are you planning to maintain it that way? Are you planning to inc uh, increase it? If you have a large collection of fish, for example, and you're not breeding any of those fishes, uh, and maybe some of those fishes are, are fish that live a couple of years only, you will have an enormous mortality. And uh, you have to be careful on how you present it, because if you have a collection of a thousand squid, by the end of the year, you'll have a thousand dead squid, because that's their lifespan. <laughs> and it's going to look really bad uh, in the press, in the hand of activists, or in the hand of an uneducated board member, and, and so forth. Uh, look at mortality in different ways. One is mortality in quarantine, because that's a very um, delicate moment for the animal. They just change in place. Sometimes you don't know where they're from, especially for species like uh, invertebrates or fish that you tend to get from suppliers that are less, uh, less standard than, than other larger animals. Uh, for if you have a lot of breeding, you'll have more deaths too, because that's a time of life where uh, animals are more prone to dying, right? When they're, when they're young before weaning. So there was a, a big scandal a few years back, uh, in, again, in the hand of ignorant or dishonest operators, I'm not very sure, but they started looking at elephant mortalities and showing how it was getting worse and worse. The problem is that it was happening at the time where more and more zoos were also breeding. And you don't expect all the babies to survive and you do expect to learn that you need a learning curve to keep them alive. So it was a little bit uh, inaccurate way of measuring. If you have an aging collection, like a lot of zoos that decide, okay, we're no longer going to keep the species or we're no longer going to breed the species, comes the point where everybody's old. Uh, like now all our tamarinds, they're all above uh, life expectancy for the species, all of them. So at, at some point we're going to get a mass mortality, but is it really a mass mortality? It might just look that way. So then you can compare, so you compare to your own records, you compare to the records uh, of those, and which you can get from Zim or from uh, other sources. And you can compare it to the uh, lifespan in the wild. For some species, it's, it's well explained. The problem compared to lifespan in the wild is that it's usually uh, very inaccurate. It's more like, a, for many species, it's more like maximum age, which is it's not a useful, it's not a useful criteria. The maximum age worldwide is about the same. People live to just over 100 years, no matter where they're, where they're born, the maximum age will be there. But the average lifespan, maybe 35 years if you're a poor black in South Africa, and it could be 82 years if you're a rich woman in Japan. So definitely the oldest Japanese and the oldest South Africa will be the same age. So you have, unfortunately, to be quite selective in that. We also use a tool called survivability, which is basically the probability of a more that's alive at the beginning of the year to still be alive at the end of the year. It sounds a bit artificial and mathematical, but it's a good way to follow your uh, your uh, collection because uh, it kind of takes into account the age, it takes into account the, how long you've had the animals, and it takes into account the historical context. So that, that's, that's a good tool if, if you had to follow something a bit more seriously. If you just decide to follow for PR purpose and you go just for the median age, meaning the age below which most animals are uh, alive or, or, or not. I find it a little bit uh, limited. It's better than average age, but it's still limited because it kind of just shows it just shows you the target becomes mediocrity as opposed to becoming performance. So mortality, you must follow it, yes, to, to identify areas of weakness. If suddenly you have twice the number of dead elephants, something went wrong, uh, you have to find out what it is. But uh, don't just rely on that. Uh, not, not a single market is sufficient. Perhaps would I want to, to add something to that? You're muted. Uh. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Paolo. And sorry for the uh, uh, disconnection, uh, Dr. Budan. We, we lost you for some bit. 
And so we pitched in with a question to Dr. Paolo regarding how do you estimate the mortality is all right in the zoo. But having said that, I will now continue with you. And if you want to, because you were on your concluding slide, and would you want to conclude that and also give us uh, your final, um, you know, uh, uh, kind of concluding remarks? And maybe I can also give you the question uh, which we got from the participants. Yeah, I think uh, from from the uh, sorry, uh, we just had a power fluctuation here, and we lost uh, connectivity. Um, so rather than go back to the slides, uh, what I what I was trying to get back to is, I, I think the conclusion is, um, being a veterinarian in zoo. We, we need to focus on our fundamentals and to provide the, the best care that we can for all of these animals. And it, it's, it's communication is extremely important, having the right uh, team in terms of well-qualified uh, keepers and curators who understand the collection animals, understand the behaviors and the presentation of symptoms for various conditions. But that makes the veterinarian's life a lot easier to manage the collections. The third part um, is the use of consultants. Um, it's not necessary that you always rely on your own expertise. Um, open it up to bring in other experts. There are a lot of uh, people, uh, even in India, there are veterinarians who are specialized in certain skill sets. Uh, I think it's good to use them. And, and if that is not sufficient, explore options to work with human physicians and surgeons who can come in and help. And last uh, but not the least is making sure that we train our veterinarians adequately to be successful as zoo veterinarians. Uh, Paula mentioned there is an absolute need that, um, you know, uh, even member secretary mentioned that we definitely need formal um, education system in place in India, for example, to provide that sort of a basic training in, in wildlife care for veterinarians to make them successful. I think that's a key. If you make the veterinarian successful in their job, zoos will be successful. And I think the overall welfare of the animals will also improve. That's my conclusion. Uh, I'll be happy to take, yeah, sorry about that last minute uh, glitch there. Absolutely not a problem, sir. I think uh, that was very well summed up and uh, especially the way you uh, gave your insights that there must be some fundamentals of veterinary uh, uh, care and science that must be used and how do we push these standards in the way we manage our uh, captive uh, animal that is extremely important uh, and thank you also for giving your insights in the trainings that you have conducted previously so the question sir for you would be and obviously uh, me and member secretary sir would be talking to you forward in the coming week on how do we take it forward actually with you is that how do we enhance the exchange of knowledge and ideas among zoo veterinarians in India and foreign zoos? So what immediately that you can think of and especially now with this post pandemic uh, situation, uh, do you think uh, there is something that you would want to throw out as an idea uh, for these exchanges? Well, uh, first and foremost, um, thank, and I, I do need to thank uh, Central Zoo Authority and Government of India, actually, even to begin to invest in training you know, your veterinary staff in, zoo, in various zoos. And a number of people within Central Zoo Authority have been instrumental in making sure that that partnership move forward. Um, what, what we find, again, in veterinary medicine, there are a number of skill sets or knowledge that you can gain from reading reading literature and textbooks but it's a clinical practice it is a hands-on practice unfortunately not being able to do hands-on training with somebody who's experienced in that field is going to be a challenge it's going to continue to be a challenge in the time of covid we are also all adapting we are all trying to create videos instructional videos for how to transfer knowledge still the it's when you have a live animal, you know that animal's life is life and death is in your hand. The seriousness and how you operate and work with that animal is very different than when you do it virtually. I think that seriousness, you know, we cannot infuse that into any sort of a virtual situation, unfortunately. So I would say the training can happen through cooperation or part, you know, partnering with other institutions that have the expertise. Um, I would say you know, Smithsonian has been one of those that we have been willing to work together, uh, bringing in people from, from you know, another country to, your, to India to provide hands-on training. 
The second scenario is to identify people who are good and qualified to go to another country to get hands-on training for a short period of time and making sure that they can continue in the job. So this is one of the things that you know, I always think about. Training is one thing, but you have to give that person a chance to practice it. So that, and then that person can become the trainer. You don't need an external input at that point. Um, so that's a way partnering is the key, uh, making sure that um, it, it, you get all the training you need for the people and making sure that the people who are coming into that field from livestock to zoo animals also have adequate expert training in that field before they come into the zoo situation and not to learn by trial and error. It's not a field that we can take a chance by trial and error. Yeah, can, I, can I also uh, answer something for that question? Um, to, to continue on uh, what Buddha was saying, really important to do the hands-on training. If I, if I can share how we did with the Southeast Asian zoos, uh, of course, this was a long time ago, before there was so much scrutiny from the so-called welfare groups, who, are, who are, unfortunately were often groups that did never touch an animal themselves, but somehow felt they were stakeholders. But before those days, it was actually normal for the, for the zoos in the region I was working to consider that their animals were accessible for training. So we would have courses, some of them as long as 10 days, uh, that would gather a number of in one facility, and we would go from group to group, anesthetizing, doing general examination, sampling, and then they had to kind of write the case the treatment plan presenting is for a long time uh, very uh, so it's affordable to the local it's really all they were only us in the region and I, I can say that now in, in Southeast Asia there, there are a number of people trained locally in schools that at the time were less than good and who, who became really proficient, competent zoo vets that you would not hesitate to give her a precious rhino or elephant or something to treat. And that is really through the, the hands-on practice, you develop that responsibility, the, the feeling that the animal has what you say it has. So you better say it right, you know, because there's no one else there to check. You're not in a teaching situation where the professor can come and correct you. What you say goes. So it kind of gives you that, uh, that sense of uh, responsibility and importance of, of what you do. So hands-on definitely uh, in, a, in a place like India with so many collections is possible. There's also a lot of scrutiny and a lot of self-appointed animal rights people who may object. I, I realize that, that situation, uh, but the, the, way, the way to do it is really hands-on, face-to-face, animal to Personally, if I may, if I may add one other point, uh, I think for the, when it comes to training, um, it is a long-term commitment. It's not a one-month training and somebody walks away. Uh, the example that from Smithsonian, what we can say is, uh, we have been engaged in training veterinarians and researchers in Thailand. It's been over 20 plus years now. And they're, they're at a point now, they do not need any of us anymore. They have an amazing group of people outstandingly trained and experienced that they conduct their own training programs these days. And it's so, so rewarding and satisfying to see how that community has evolved. Um, and that is where we should be heading. And that is what we should set aside for. Absolutely right, sir. I think uh, capacity building is just, just not one time. It has to continue and continue again and again. Uh, but due to time constraints, we will not be able to take uh, any more discussion on this. But having said that, I have one question for Dr. S. P. Yadav as well. Uh, because uh, this is another point of view, which is perhaps of interest to everyone, is that should zoos continue to act as rescue and rehabilitation centers? Because as per the act, every zoo uh, must act as a rescue center. But uh, we have been hearing that there is definitely a lot of pressure then on the zoos uh, to manage uh, rescue animals as well. So uh, do you think that uh, time has come that we also kind of specialize in having specialized rescue centers? Uh, Sonali, uh, uh, very well said. In fact, uh, the human wildlife conflict is emerging as the biggest challenge before the protected area manager or forest officers of the country. Everywhere we are seeing uh, 
human tiger conflict, uh, racist macaque conflict, leopard entering into human dominated landscape, elephants, and all these things that they, they are big, posing as the biggest threat also and the biggest challenge also. And I think the zoo, they have to perform this kind of social service. It's a part of their duty to serve the humanity as well as the animal kingdom uh, by providing the rescue services. Uh, it is true that in our country, we, we need more rescue centers. Uh, they are in paucity, there is dearth of such facilities, but we definitely need more rescue centers. But zoo, zoos should continue to provide uh, the rescue facilities because it's a very good synergy. The doctors are available, they, how to treat the animal, how to, uh, how to uh, treat uh, uh, diseases, their wounds and all. And such things, this expertise is already available with the zoo. So providing rescue services in a zoo is utilizing the synergy properly. I think that they, they should go on, but definitely we need more dedicated rescue centers in different parts of the country. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you to all our esteemed uh, listeners and our expert speakers. It has been wonderful hearing all of you. And uh, we wish you all uh, a very, very happy uh, remaining rest of the day. But having said that, uh, my team back here in Mysore Zoo, as well as in the Central Zoo Authority for all the backup. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And uh, we look forward to learning a lot uh, again from all of you. Thank you and good night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Paulo, and thank you, Dr. Budan. <laughs>